The Cannabis Conversation. A European perspective on the emerging legal cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Conversation with the News to Sai, where we explore the new legal cannabis industry by speaking to the professionals that are helping to shape it. Hope you're all well. Another busy week. I went to the London Stock Exchange last week for the Cannabis Capital Forum, which was hosted by Crystal Capital. Proud to say that I was the most underdressed person there. There were a lot of suits. It wasn't the most diverse event I've been to either. It's... I think I maybe saw two women in the crowd, but it was very interesting, very illuminating, some interesting talks and panels and really encouraging to see the LSE very positive on the sector and also just nice to be out and about and seeing people in person. So hopefully there'll be many more conferences and events to attend now that things are hopefully opening up. In the news, there's been a very exciting story coming out of Italy who appear to be set to decriminalise low-level home cultivation and personal use on the recreational side, which is a very exciting and progressive step for a major European nation to take. And hot on their heels, it sounds like things are, are getting very interesting in Germany as well. There are federal elections happening near the end of September And medical cannabis was legalized in Germany in 2017. But now there is all party support for reform around recreational cannabis, even amongst the conservatives, which is a promising development. There is a possible recreational trial under discussion post-election. And hopefully, if this comes to pass, this might accelerate things in Europe. The UK government has recently reiterated its non-evidence-based approach to drug policy. So I'm not expecting any miracles here anytime soon. However, if major European nations start making some money from this industry, I think that will certainly change the picture here. So let's see what happens. On a personal note, I have put together a webinar for Global Go next week about what's happening in the UK. For those that don't know, uh, Global Go are a North American cannabis consultancy and I represent the UK for them. I've invited Professor David Nutt to give the keynote talk. He'll be updating us on Project 2021. I'll also be chairing a panel to give an overview of the medical cannabis landscape in the UK. Dr. anne Catherine Schlag from Drug Science will be joining us. Uh, Nick Patiras from Materia will also be joining us. Ed McDermott from Seed Innovations um, and also from EMAC now. Cureleaf will be there too. And finally, Harry Gugliani from Columbia Care will be completing the panel. It's happening on the 21st of September, which is next Tuesday at 6 p.m. in the UK, which I think is 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Please do join if you can. I'll be circulating details on the Cannabis Conversation LinkedIn page in the next couple of days. Anyway, on with the show. I've got a great episode now dissecting the entourage effect. A small correction needed. Paula is no longer working for Avicana, as was the case when we recorded the episode uh, a couple of months ago. So just need to make that note there. Anyway, enjoy. On today's show, I have Dr. Paula Kubijos, who is a medical cannabis doctor and educator from Colombia. She's also director of global medical affairs for Avicana, as well as a few other roles in the medical cannabis industry. Paula, welcome. How are you today? Thank you. Thank you for having me, Anush. I'm really well. Thank you. Good, good, good. Where in the world are you? I'm right now in Cali, Colombia. Cool. Great. Well, look, we've got lots of stuff to talk about. Very interesting topic. The entourage effect gets talked about a lot in this industry, but I'm not sure that everyone has as fuller understanding as you do. So I'm hoping you can share some of your wisdom. But we'll get on to that in a minute. We'll begin at the sort of normal place where we'll talk a bit about you. And so if you can introduce yourself and maybe talk a bit about your background and how and why you got into studying and working with medical cannabis. That is always a million dollar question, isn't it? Especially for a clinician. And uh, you don't see a lot of clinicians trying to wade their feet into the world of medical cannabis. But my story is similar to the stories of others. I trained as a medical doctor in Colombia 
And shortly after uh, working for a few years here in Colombia, I moved to Canada with my family. And, you know, Canada has been now, is now known around the world as this medical cannabis hub. Many of the medical cannabis movement started there. So by virtue of being in the clinical world and getting to know patients, they start talking to you about using medical cannabis. And as a clinician who trained in a country where drugs are off limits and everything you hear about drugs is that they're, they're bad for you. you. You do not get close to them. And everybody who uses any drug is going to have a problematic use. So for me, getting to Canada and listening to patient stories was quite of a dissonant kind of a scenario. So I started looking more into medical, into cannabis, into what THC and CBD did on my very own. I didn't have any formal training on it, but hearing these patient stories that were very compelling about people being able to sleep better, to get off their medications, to be able to control their pain better, and overall improving the quality of life, I said, well, you know, th- there might be something to this. So I immediately reached out to Dr. Donald Abrams in California. He's a really well-renowned researcher in the area. And I asked him to, are there any courses or any, you know, training that one can take to learn more? And he directed me to uh, an organization in the United States. That's where I did my training. And I started incorporating medical cannabis as part of my, my, my routine. And so I, I became comfortable using medical cannabis, talking to patients about medical cannabis counseling as to where they're it would be a good therapeutic tool for their particular condition or their situation. And then I moved to Colombia four years ago and I've been doing research and training and educating and conferencing in this area. And I recently joined the Abicana, which is a local licensed producer, a Colombo Canadian licensed producer and very much trying to ascertain what uh, physicians' needs are in terms of education and uh, tools to help them understand what sort of role medical cannabis can play into their therapeutic um, regimes that they start with their patients. And so, yeah, it's a quite a varied, I pick of a, a bit of varied background uh, in terms of getting to where I am today and talking to you. Yeah, sure. Wow, that's really interesting, and particularly the bit around Colombia and coming from a country where drugs is quite an issue in that to you everyone is sort of pushing you in one direction i guess kind of reevaluate something that is known as a narcotic how did you find that challenge so it wasn't as, as challenging for me i guess straight from the outset because you see people you see people getting better and you see people you know deriving great results from using cannabis and these are people that wouldn't necessarily you would consider as potheads. I mean, they're not seeking cannabis for the sake of using it recreationally in order to have, you know, the psychoactive effects and to get a good, you know, to be relaxed and having fun at home. These were people who were using it for medical reasons. So they were really desperate. Their long lines of medications didn't do much for them. They caused quite a bit of side effects. We know the huge issues that we have with the opioid epidemic in Canada and the United States. So many people were coming from that background, seeking something to help them, to help them to be able to perform better, to function better, to sleep better. So just overall improvements. And that's what they were finding with cannabis. And once you start sort of looking at the science and understanding the endocannabinoid system and the interaction between the two main cannabinoids, the THC and the CBD with this endocannabinoid system, how it can actually play a role in modulating these pain pathways and the anxiety pathways and appetite and things like that. So you understand that there's a little bit of background. I like to be as science-based as possible, understanding that I need to listen to my patient, that I need to validate their experience as well. So, and this is where, you know, the world of evidence-based medicine is all about. We forget, and, and sometimes in the medical world, we think it's just the result of the randomized controlled trials, the placebo controlled, and, and all of that, and the systematic reviews, when in reality, it's a combination of the results of the good quality studies, the patient experience, and also your own clinical experience have to come and play an equal role into you being able to formulate a patient or a recommendation for a patient. So it wasn't so difficult for me, but I see a lot of difficulty in that area. Other clinicians accepting the fact that the cannabis could be a medicine as well as it can be something that people enjoy for their own purposes. Yeah, and I was just going to ask about that as well. So your colleagues and your friends and other doctors, how have they kind of received the you know when you moved into this area were there any kind of funny looks or more 
Absolutely. So at the beginning, uh, when I started lecturing and, and going into conferences, speaking about medical cannabis, the, the question is, or the, the, you know, between laughter and, and in a funny kind of looking way, they would ask what you use, you consume, thinking that one would be speaking on behalf of the plant. And that was not, and I'm, at least not in my experience anyway, I was just trying to present the science. But this was just like four or five years ago. Right now, we're having a more mature conversation because there's so much science that is coming into play that we can portray, that one can portray confidently to say this is what it's making a big difference in the realm of chronic pain, in the treatment of anxiety, in the treatment of palliative care symptoms. And also, given that the other pharmaceutical therapy agents are not doing a fantastic job at, at tackling many of these issues that cannabis do tackle not fantastically well, but they, but they do tackle it in a way that is satisfactory for most people. So they start to open their eyes and see, okay, maybe there's something to this, but definitely data is what's going to get them to the uptake is going to be more significant as more of me present more studies for more robust clinical trials. But it has changed. They do believe, and I have run my own survey studies in Colombia ascertaining what the perceptions are in the medical community that are very open for the use of medical cannabis in these instances where other things have failed for, of course, you're out of recourse and you turn to something that you might feel that is therapeutic. So in the realm of palliative care, cancer associated treatments, refractory epilepsy, which is, you know, a condition that it's, it's very much validated by science now, the use of CBD. And in other conditions where, again, the pharmaceutical agents have failed, they do believe that there is a role. The problem is that they don't know how to use it. So there's a big disconnect between what they think it could be useful for and the implementation of it. We know that cannabis or medical cannabis or the use of cannabinoid-based medicines is a very individualized therapy. You need to start with the dosing and titrating and being patient with your patient and, and accompanying them on that, on that therapeutic road. So it requires a bit of resources as well. So that might be something that not a lot of people are really inclined into following just because we're used to the 15 minute medicine and you take your Advil and off, off you go and you call me in a month kind of thing. So there are barriers for sure, but we're trying to come up with ways that we can uh, surpass them and we can help them adopt a cannabis as a therapeutic agency. But now that it's being covered by many of the insurance companies down here in Colombia. So that's really positive. Access is also yeah. a key here. Yeah, as it is the world over, I think. And I think what's really interesting, it sounds like, you know, there's obviously a lot of work to do, but there seems to be a good amount of progression that's happened. Now it's a more open discussion rather than a, a bit of a joke kind of thing, which is great. And then the final thing on this, I guess, you know, having been sort of more classically trained, I suppose, surprised were you when you were learning about the endocannabinoid system? Because I assume that that isn't taught generally in medical schools. It is not. And it was, it was just amazing for me to, to understand or to come to the realization that there was something that was supposed to act like a circuit breaker, like it just puts a stop to many of the things that are going haywire that it shouldn't be doing or having as much activity to control things. I had no idea. And this is a, a really unique phenomenon with the endocannabinoid system, something that, uh, you know, I guess you've talked to many of your guests about the endocannabinoid system, but to know that there is a system in place that acts backwards to stop the action of many of these neurons, to stop the firing or the production of many of these neurotransmitters, to slow down, to say enough. When the cell is receiving the message says it's enough, I don't want to receive any more. You, your endocannabinoid system kicks in and that's how you can control things. So this was a revolutionary concept to me. I don't think it's quite unique to the endocannabinoid system. I don't want to say with 100% confidence that there isn't any other system out there that works in the same way, but I haven't heard it, I think, at that point when I learned about the endocannabinoid system. So it is quite revolutionary. However, we cannot just pretend that by learning or knowing the function of the endocannabinoid system, we can expect cannabis to work in the same way. So I just want to make that very clear because... Some of the points that are used by many industry players is that, yes, doctors need to be educating in the endocannabinoid system. Yes, for sure, there's a great need there. But that doesn't mean the cannabis is going to work in the same way that the two arachidinyl glycerol and the anandamide are going to work when they're being produced naturally 
and in a physiological condition. So it's great that we do need to learn about it. And I think the more we incorporate this into the curriculum of the many medical programs around the world, people will start opening up a bit more, understanding that THC is a partial agonist and the CBD is a negative allosteric modulator and understanding how they work in that interaction with the endocannabinoid system. But we also need the clinical results. Yeah, huge amounts of good stuff there. And as always, and I was really glad I've got you on the show, a nice bit of balance there to kind of keep everyone's feet on the ground. And before we sort of get on to the entourage effect as, as the main topic, what are you up to now in terms of, you know, your various projects in this space? So I've been uh, working with Avi Kana as a global medical director for medical affairs. So this is very much involved in educating physicians, talking with them, understanding what their learning needs and their education needs are, what tools they need to be able to implement the use of medical cannabis or cannabinoid-based medicine, you know, writing papers, scientific papers, and just putting evidence out there, collecting information also from patients. It's something that we're starting to do as well with a patient program that we have implemented. So, you know, an effort to collect as much standardized information about the actual performance of the products in the real world. So this is what we call like real world data. So we're trying to do something very similar, trying to establish our own registries and overall just talking with people and educating them about medical cannabis. I also belong to other NGOs here in Colombia. One is a medical association that centers around medical cannabis, again, with the same purpose of organizing events and conferences and, and bringing like top quality speakers to educate our physicians down here in Colombia. And the other NGO is one that is centered around lobbying the government in a way for better or so that the conditions are better for the smaller and the medium sized growers that are really, you know, they found it really difficult to become a, a significant player in the industry as of now. So yeah, those are my many hats. Yeah, fantastic. Well, great job that you're doing and, and thank you for doing it. Let's get on to the main topic then. So the entourage effect. You know, it's definitely something that everyone talks about. And as I said at the beginning, I'm not sure it's that well understood. It's quite a romantic notion, I think. I like the symbolism of it all, but let's talk a bit about what the actual evidence is and where we need to, I mean, where we need more of it. And so let's maybe start at the beginning. What exactly is the theory of behind the entourage effect? So this is a concept that was formulated by Dr. Mahulam and Bel Shabbat back in the 1998, I think is when their first paper came out, when they talked about the different components of the endocannabinoid system altering the effects of the two main endocannabinoids, the 2-AG and the anandamide, on the cannabinoid 1 receptor. So they thought, okay, so there are these substances that look like the two main endocannabinoids that are going to change the effect that these two main cannabinoids have. So that's where it all started. It had nothing to do with the plant. But then it slowly, the industry, and I guess everybody who's interested in the cannabis and the cannabis plant started to take it up to say, or to interpret it as, as being that the components of the whole plant are going to do a much better job at achieving a response than an individual component. So an individual meaning probably just the THC or just the CBD, which are the main or the most widely studied molecules that are derived from the cannabis plant. So they believe that by the oleoflavonoids and the terpenoids that are in the plant and the trichomes of the, the cannabis flower are going to do a much better job at you know, reducing pain or helping you sleep better, or probably you're controlling the nausea better. So this is the, the theory, this is a hypothesis that has been, and then again, we have to give credit to Dr. Ethan Russo, who's the one who has been really doing a lot of work in this area and just postulating this, this hypothesis for the world to understand and to see. I have to say that at the beginning, when I started learning about medical cannabis, the notion of the different components of the plan was quite complicated in my mind. And maybe for me as a doctor to go out and to recommend something, not just based on the THC and CBD content, but maybe on this long laundry list of components that the, the product that I have in front of me could have. It sounded fantastic. Yes, it, it is a really nice idea to think that in an orchestra kind of fashion, all these uh, components are going to act better for the patient's benefit. But in practice, it just becomes a bit a bit more complicated. So I guess we can keep chatting about the difficulties there. Well, yeah, I was just going to say, so yeah, I think the theory and the, the idea of it is, again, like it's, it's quite romantic to think that this might be the case. What is the actual evidence behind it? 
So the evidence that the industry and the scientific community has taken up so far to perhaps hint at the existence of an entourage effect comes mainly from anecdotal evidence. So when people smoke cannabis or use cannabis in an inhaled format, they experience things differently depending on the different chemovars. So we don't want them to call them strains because we're not talking bacteria. We're not talking any other uh, animals. So the, the different chemovars that have different composition, a chemical composition, are going to elicit different effects on people who were mainly smoking cannabis or using a cannabis inhaled. So they would have different psychoactive effects depending on what they thought or would be, you know, the different components of the plant that they were using. So this is, it's all, it's all stemming from there. Now, scientifically speaking, there have been some efforts, not a lot of efforts to try to validate this notion of the, the presence of the different components changing the effect of the two main cannabinoids, the THC and the CBD on the cannabinoid one receptor, which we know is mainly responsible for the many effects that one sees when we're using medical cannabis. So there's been some in vitro research from Australia and New Zealand that have tried to say, okay, so we, we know that the THC is going to do something to the cannabinoid one receptor. What happens if we add these other components, the humulene, the linalool, the pinene? And it turns out that an in vitro model, at least, it's not changing much. So right there and then, and again, and I have to make this, the caveat is that it's an in vitro experiment. Rarely these in vitro experiments, they're great for generating hypotheses and for us to be able to move forward in science. Those are the building blocks, but that doesn't work the same way in humans at all. So those two studies out of uh, New Zealand, Australia that were published in 2019 and 2020, they just basically didn't find any effect of this combination of the terpenes that they found either individually or all together when they combined it with the cannabinoid receptor agonist, particularly THC, they didn't find that it changed much. And the paper that was published just this year in Nature found something different. So in this case, they did do the uh, in vitro assays and they also did animal studies where they showed that individually at really insane amounts of terpenes though, this is uh, something in the, uh, they stated in the paper, something like 200 milligrams per kilogram that that was injected inside the peritoneal cavity. So in the abdomen of these animals and they saw certain effects when they injected the different terpenes, like the humulene, the linalool, the geraniol, pinene. So they found effects like what the animals would experience when you would use THC, for example. So they found cannabinoid-like effects when they used the terpenes on their own. And they also found that for analgesia, they subjected these animals to pain tests as well. And they found that the combination with a cannabinoid agonist, in this case, it wasn't THC, it was a synthetic agonist, it elicited a better analgesia when in the combination of these chemicals, the terpenes and the cannabinoid agonist. So in my mind, this is sort of the first, you know, hard, you know, proof that we have that there might be something to the entourage effect. So the idea that the combination of compounds that are derived from the cannabis plant are going to elicit at least better analgesia in those conditions where they tested in the animals. Other than that, we don't have a lot of, we, we don't have any clinical studies. Dr. Russo, I heard him recently in a podcast as well. And he said that there are clinical studies that are being carried out in the United States trying to see whether the addition of certain terpenes would improve the analgesic effect of the THC and the CBD. So we'll see there. But, and I cannot forget that there is something to be said about the modulatory effect that CBD has over THC. That's why and this is something that I that I definitely believe in, and we have seen now in clinical practice and in the many clinical studies as well, that the presence of CBD does change the effect that the THC is going to have. And I don't want to get too complicated here, but the, the way that scientists think that the CBD is going to act in the cannabinoid one receptor is changing the conformation of the cannabinoid one receptor and therefore the effect of the THC or the other agonists are going to have at that level of that receptor is going to be different. And, and we see it in a way that we see less psychoactivity and less side effects when we're using a product that has the two components, the THC and the CBD, as opposed to just the THC molecule. So in that way, the entourage is very much now, I, I guess, accepted in the, the, the scientific community when it comes to the terpenes. The, I guess the judge is still out there and we still need to do more, more clinical studies to understand 
whether I, when I'm prescribing a medical cannabis product, I need to just not just pay attention to the THC and CBD ratios or concentrations, but also all the long laundry list of terpenes that might come in the, in the product. Okay. Wow. There's a thousand questions mm-hmm. I want to ask. <laughs> so I guess, look, I mean, if you take it a step back in the theory of it, when you've got the plant, you've got not only the THC and the CBD, the predominant cannabinoids, you've got a mixed bag of terpenes depending on the cultivar chemovar but then you also have a number of minor cannabinoids right are they looking at those is that a factor that they're studying as well or is that is it too small and too vast to accurately kind of track so there's great interest now in these smaller cannabinoids and i can talk about for example cannabigerol it's one of these molecules it's considered to be the mother cannabinoid that is present in the plant and then from there it derives all the other cannabinoids there's great interest there there are some pharmaceutical companies that are developing cannabigerol and had, that have applied, for example, in the United States, there's a company, I think, that now has an orphan drug designation for a cannabigerol-based uh, product for Huntington's disease. It's going to have different effects. It's going to have, you know, different impact on the cannabinoid run receptor. It's going to have anti-inflammatory effects. So there could be that there is an entourage-like effect with the addition of something like cannabigerol to your two main cannabinoids. But we need to test that. Out of Australia, Zelira Therapeutics, so the company that used to be Zelda Therapeutics, that used to belong to Mara Gordon, for example, they were trying a cannabinoid-based product that contained THC, CBD, and CBN for sleep. So it's just a combination of the three. They tested it in a clinical trial. They had good results. But again, I cannot tell you if you remove the CBN, you're going to have the same effects. If you remove the CBD, you're going to have the same effects. It's the combination of the three that was tested in that in that setting. And that uh, proved to be beneficial for, for sleep, for insomnia. So there are efforts that are being put out there to try to incorporate these minor cannabinoids. But we just need to test. And, and the, the fact that the plant just gives us so much, it just makes things way more complicated, I suppose, to the traditional you know, development pathway that one would follow for any other traditional uh, therapeutic uh, agent. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, so I think, you know, you can have up to four, five hundred different elements or compounds in in the plant. I guess it's virtually impossible to track all of those because you've got infinite possibilities of combinations, right? Yeah, that, that that is true. That is true. But something that, for example, David Mary is doing in Israel, he's trying to run different assays on this different colorectal cancer or other types of cancer cell lines. And he's trying very judiciously, trying to inject into these different cell lines the different combinations of the cannabinoids and the terpenes that are coming from different chemovars and assessing the response, whether those cells die or not. And then from there, to see what combinations are most promising, he's hoping to be able to develop products out of those. But then you're looking just at the apoptotic effect that the combination of cannabinoids would have so apoptotic meaning that the cancer cells is going to die. So you're in a way, you're, you're fostering cell death using these combinations of products and taking those that are looking more promising, as I said, to a clinical development. So, but, but yeah, the, the area is so vast. And so the possibilities are almost endless that it's mind boggling in a way to be thinking that we might in one day understand everything there is to understand about, about the cannabis plant. Yeah. I've been to see Professor Mary talk a few times and he talks basically sort of narrowing it down to the top four cannabinoids and then playing with ratios just amongst those four. And I suppose it's part of this, and I hope this doesn't sound too hippie and weird, but (laughs) it's part of it like you have to subscribe to some kind of X factor because of the number of what would be termed as contaminants, right, in a study if you're lots of the smaller elements but that you can't possibly get your head around all of the what's in there. Is there a kind of X factor element to it that adds some complexity? There could well be. I have to say that many of these observations that have, you know, been collected to to put forward the idea of the entourage effect have been put forward by the people who are experienced cannabis users. So people who can tell us to that level of sophistication, you know, how they feel each chemo of differently in comparison to others that they may have tried. I don't think that if we're going to present cannabis, at least as a medicine that is going to be widely used, we should require that level of sophistication from people. <laughs> I mean, people need to make decisions on the day to day about many other things and thinking about 
you know, the complexity of the product that is in front of them shouldn't be one of those conditions that we put in front of them. So that's why, in a way, while we get the science and the more robust data supporting the idea and the notion of the entourage effect, I think clinicians, we're going to be better off just going by the THC and CB ratio because that's what we know. That's what the studies show us. That's where we have the clinical data as opposed to you just making it more complicated, hoping that there is an entourage effect or whether there might be when we don't know in reality if that's going to be the case. I hope that that makes sense. It's just basically acting on what we know and what we wish we knew about the plant. Yeah, no, no, that makes complete sense. And one of the things I was thinking is, you know, you've got the active compounds, which I suppose addressing the particular ailment or condition that you have. Are some of the other compounds is the part that they play in the whole process about breaking down those active compounds as well and, and sort of making it all efficient in how it's dealt with. So it might not necessarily be actively targeting something, but it's helping to Absolutely. So it could have, it could have like many different ways that they could act together in concert to create a much better product. You're right. So when we talk about, for example, THD and CBD, we do not just consider the CBD to be a having an impact on the cannabinoid one receptor. It's going to act in many other receptors as well. And it's also going to act at the level of the enzymes that are going to be breaking down your own endocannabinoids. So that might be a way that it can also augment the effect of the THC, for instance. So that could be something, you know, there's there's a lot to be said about that. And the other compounds as well that are present in the cannabis plant, they could be acting on many other different receptors that are not necessarily the CB1 or the CB2, which are the canonical endocannabinoid receptors, but also GRP55, TRPV1, P par gammas, and all these other compounds or, or these other receptors that we're just learning about that are an integral part of the endocannabinoid receptor in a way that also interact with other molecules that could augment the effect of what's in front of you. But Again, we have so much, there's so much that we don't know yet. These are just hypotheses that we are formulating as of now and testing them. I'm imagining it's going to be quite complicated if you want to get pharmaceutical product out of that. But but I'm not saying it's impossible. I think in a way what we're doing with this real world data and people just signing up on their apps and recording their experience and what they feel with the different chemo that they're using this could be a way that we could start sort of getting signals as to this this big data kind of exercises and collections of information to know whether there's a particular terpene that is really showing signals in appetite stimulation, for example. Or in the adult use setting, you know, if it's going to be something that is going to be more sedating or more invigorating, more energizing, th- those qualities that people usually seek from cannabis. But I think we need a lot of information and huge amounts of data to be able to draw those conclusions, or at least pick out the ones that are looking more promising and then carrying them forward for further development. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, that segues nicely into my kind of final question around around real world evidence versus clinical trials. And we've also talked on the show a number of times how the kind of standard gold standard clinical trials are very much based around single compounds. How do you see the interaction between real world evidence and clinical trials? Because you know, as in life, you know, to lead a healthy life isn't just about exercising or just about eating good food or X, Y, and Z. It's a combination of factors. In the same way, I would assume medicine, you have to take a few different things and sometimes they work better together than others. How do you see those two things marrying up? So I think that they're great complement. We definitely need the randomized control trial data. That is no question. That is what is expected from other medicines as well. I don't understand why it shouldn't be expected from medical cannabis eventually. And there are companies, and we already have many biopharmaceutical and biotech companies that are trying to follow that path. Not because we need to please the regulators, but also because this is the way that medicine has established to try to define as narrowly as possible, whether a medicine is going to fa- have a desired effect or, or not. So this is the gold standard. Now we have this great methods of collecting real world information through our registries, through apps, through the different observational studies that are being carried over around the world. And these are great to complement those kinds of data. I don't think they will ever replace it. And just because we don't have through these observational collections of information, we're not going to have a way to control for the different confounders that are out there. If I eat something or if I feel, you know, a certain way one day or another, that could influence as well what the, the experience I may have with my medicine. So those are more difficult to control when you're collecting information in such a wide 
and you're casting such a wide net, but it will be, we're selling these products, you know, people have access to these products. So I think it's the responsibility of everybody in the industry to collect as much standardized data from these products as possible. So we can keep feeding the amount of information that is the good quality information that is, that is coming out. I know there are great registries happening in the UK. The project 2021 and Sapphire clinics are running great registries as well that are where they're implementing all these really standardized tools, uh, validated tools, as you would use in a clinical trial to ascertain how people are responding to medical cannabis. I think that's a responsible thing to do. You know, not doing so, we're, we're losing a great uh, opportunity to collect information. I'm all about data and information. And I actually, before I joined Avicana, I was part of a, a company that provided services, research services in that area and the registries and observational studies, because I think that it's, it's really important to start sort of collecting this information and not just to please the regulators, but also to give patients information, more information for them to be able to make an informed decision about. Yeah, absolutely. And more data cannot help uh, hurt. It will only help. Brilliant. Well, Paola, thank you so much. And I think, you know, what's clear is there's so much more to learn and this will be rapidly evolving. So I would love to have you back on the show at some point to follow up and see how the newest research is reflecting on, on all of this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great time. Thank you for having me. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please subscribe, rate, review and share the podcast. It will help me spread the good word on how this amazing industry is developing. I work with various cannabis startups to help them get funded and grow. I also work with corporates and international cannabis companies to help them understand and navigate the European cannabis sector. We're working with some great clients across the cannabis value chain and we'd love to help you too. If you're interested, please visit www.canverse.global to get in touch.